Hold on, are they fighting orcs? Hold on, are those are those orc machines right there? Are those fighting a, a wag? Can't quite tell. You can't see who exactly are shooting, but I'm gonna say they're fighting a wag. Those look like orc machines. Hey there, guys. All right, today we are learning how to become an Astartes Space Marine Creation slash Recruitment by Lewitin. Now, before we dive in. Um, I do want to give an update on when I plan on watching Hell's Reach and, uh, the part two to, uh, Lewitin's, uh, Imperium of Man, uh, video. What I am thinking of doing, and I think this is how I might try and do it for the longer Warhammer 40k videos, is I think I will live stream my reactions to that, um, to those, uh, uh, We'll do it that way. I'll live stream the reaction and then I'll just upload the live stream or I'll probably edit the live stream a bit uh, to fit kind of how I do things here on the channel. Um, still largely pretty much um, where I just kind of ramble in tangents though. I don't cut those, I won't cut those out, but like, you know, still maybe cut out some typical live stream fluff if there's any. Um, so. Um, but I want to make it a follower goal, um, to kind of incentivize y'all, um, for me to watch Hell's Reach, let's go with, uh, let's hit 500 followers over on Twitch, and once I hit 500 followers, um, I will then make another, whenever we hit 500 followers, a following Warhammer video, um, I will mention at the beginning of that video saying, when exactly I will be watching the Hell's live reacting to the Hell's Reach movie um, uh, on Twitch so that you guys will have plenty of uh, um, time ahead to like uh, show up for that stream if you are able to make it or whatever. So that is just not like a complete surprise and you're like, oh, I missed it. You didn't tell us or whatever. Right. I'm going to make sure I tell you. I tell you ahead of time. Um, and the reason I want to do this is one, my own time outside of recording video, the time I have to record videos, and then the time I devote to streaming, right? This just better fits um, for so that I can have more time to do other things during the day. Um, and two, I don't know how uh, Games Workshop will react to me reacting to Hell's Reach. I don't know what their um, um, copyright policy will be on that uh, necessarily um, because that is, you know, it's, again, it's a two and a half hour movie of, I believe, an audio book of theirs. Um, so that is on a line that I am iffy about, uncertain about when it comes to corporations. Um, so I want to just like, you know, um, and it's not necessarily like the money that, uh, I am concerned about losing. Um, I don't necessarily care too much about that. Um, I mean, money's nice and all, but it's more so, uh, the views. Um, I like just seeing the views. So I don't, I don't know if like Games Workshop will like, lit restricted in any way or whatever so i just want to be like all right if, if i can't upload it to youtube at least i can have it like there will be a, where you guys some of you will have at least been able to watch it on twitch or something like that it'll stay up on twitch for like two weeks unless they dmca the twitch channel which i don't know if they'll do um so again this is just me trying to cover my ass <laughs> uh on a legal front um, in regards to reactions, because reactions aren't really all that. I think there have been two big cases in terms of reactions, both of which essentially kind of are on opposite ends uh, of what has been established. There really hasn't been anything that has really set exactly how well covered reactions are or are under fair use. Um, the general gist is, um, at least the way that I understand how it is. Um, honestly, the kind of the one thing you just have to do for a reaction is kind of at the end of the video, you have to kind of 
you, you give your thoughts and you're like, yeah, this was good or whatever. You kind of review it is essentially what I believe, last, at least last I checked, um, essentially a, what would constitute a reaction as fair use. You just kind of review it at the end. Um, and also, kind of, I think YouTube has it where as long as it's not a, uh, a, another way of watching your, like, the original content or whatever, I guess. I don't know. The law is weird and confusing. So with that said, though, um, right, give me, go ahead, follow me over at Twitch. The link is down in the description box below, or if there's a pinned comment, it's also in the pinned comment, in, uh, my pinned comment. Um, go follow me over at Twitch. We hit 500. Um, there will be a Warhammer 40k video reaction where I will explicitly say when I will be reacting to Hell's Reach, and we'll go from there. Sound good? Sound good? So make sure to share this video and help, help, help me hit that number. We're over 400 followers on Twitch, so it's not, it's not too far away. Um, but with all that said, let's dive into the Astartes Space Marine Creation Recruitment, blah, blah, blah. There is only wag. I I do want to say I am a little upset. At least as of recording this, the orc video didn't get as many views as I thought it would. I really thought it would do better analytically, but it did. It's sitting at like six thousand views right now, which I mean, technically is pretty fucking good for my channel. But in terms of the Warhammer videos, isn't. <laughs> if the Warham if a Warhammer video does less than like ten thousand views, I kind of consider it a sucky video. I'm upset that the I had so much fun with the the orc video. Damn. Anyways, that was a tangent. Shoulder pads for days, baby. Oh, it's just slowly zooming in. Very ominous. They shall be my finest warriors. These men who give themselves to me. Like clay I shall mould them, and in the furnace of war I shall forge them. They shall be of iron will, and steely sinew. In great armour I shall clad them, and with the mightiest weapons they shall be armed. They will be untouched by plague or disease, no sickness shall blight them. They shall have such tactic strategies and machines that no foe will best them in battle. They are my bulwark against the terror. They are the defenders of humanity. They are my space marines. And they shall know no fear. Space Marines are humanity's most elite fighting force. They're the defenders of civilization, but their immense power is forged through a harsh selection process, extreme genetic and body modifications. This grueling transformation kills many recruits, and those who do survive it are left arguably barely human. The conversion from weak mortal to demi-godlike superhuman is one gifted to only a tiny amount of humans in the 41st millennium. And Astartes, when his transformation is complete, will be stronger, tougher, mentally more powerful by factors than an ordinary human. And while a Space Marine's prime mission is it. to protect humanity, their physical disparity from ordinary common humans can actually leave many Astartes to look down on these lesser common humans. Well, I mean, kind of just physically they have to. Look how fucking tall they are. Of course they gotta look down on the rest of humans. Humans are what, six feet? I don't know what the average height of a human is in Warhammer, but like, let's say he averages six feet. These fuckers are like ten feet tall, right? At least, or something like that? Of course they gotta look down. While others will feel a renewed sense of dedication to protect those who can barely protect themselves. It's important to remember that Space Marines are the defenders of humanity and not the rulers of it. Humans, for better or worse, have been the leaders of the Imperium of Man until recently with the return of Primarch Robot Gulliman. While the transformation of a human to Space Marine is complex, you'll often hear the terminology of a gene seed be used. Now, a gene seed is not literally a seed, but it is a specific organ that each Astartes carries with seed-like qualities. It's a that was an intrusive thought. <laughs> 
And I did not censor myself. The term used to describe generally the genetic material of an Astartes. It's more accurately the cells and DNA required to engineer a human into an Astartes. The gene seed, more specifically though, refers to the space marine's progenoid glands, and the clue is in the name there when you think of progeny. These organs in a space marine respond to the other genetic implants they have and replicate DNA. Essentially, they so is it like uh, how in The Witcher, um, like how Witcher babies are made, like in the trial of grasses. They are, in a manner of speaking, an asexual form of reproduction, which is why when a space marine is fatally wounded on a battlefield, an apothecary will fight to recover his gene seed. It's also why, yes, space marines do not require heterosexual reproduction. Five years from implantation, a space marine's neck progenoid glands can be harvested, but the chest glands won't be harvested up until 10 years. Space marines essentially depend on themselves to produce new marines for the chapter. Lastly, in this general sphere of discussion, to answer a very commonly discussed topic, are space marines actually castrated? And then, how do they excrete waste? Well, I can't actually recall anywhere in written law this being noted, so if anybody has a specific point of reference, please do link it. But my speculation, based on a few things that I've kind of looked at, is that pretty much the canon opinion is that space marines have no sexual drive. However, when it comes to excretion, it's true that their armor is also an environment suit that would cycle and process their own waste, much like a still suit in the... I was about to literally say a still suit from Dune. Dune universe. Also, space marines do not live in their armor, although they may wear it for extended periods of time. It can be removed. It's entirely possible that their external genitals are removed and they no. have implants to take care no. of waste. No, not my pee pee. I guess. All right, I I can't be a I can't be in a Stardis then. Nope, I can't do it. No one's no one's touching me down there. No, no, no. You keep that knife away. Keep it away but I've got nothing to see that it points towards this. So it's an unknown, but it's not something that's critically really important in the scheme of things. It's equally possible that it's just seen as an organ as with everything else, and they just leave it all be. Okay. Well, maybe they make it bigger. Now before we look further into how a space marine is forged in the 41st millennium, let's remind ourselves how they were created over history. Now the first form of space marine was originally created by the Emperor during the unification wars of the late 30th millennium. Earth at this time was a barren wasteland of scavengers and barbaric warring tribes after civilization had videos. imploded as a result of the Age of Strife. Earth being cut off from its supply routes in the warp cannibalized itself and fell into total anarchy. After the Emperor originally created Techno-Barbarians, a crude adapted form of super soldier, he would form them later into the Thunder Warriors. These warriors were brutal, powerful, and most importantly, highly unstable. The Emperor knew that he wouldn't be able to work with these unstable? soldiers- Unstable? Bro, they're my brothers. Was ...forged in the fires of anarchy beyond the unification of Earth's warring tribes. And so he secretly constructed his genetic facilities in a fortress deep below vast mountain ranges on Earth. Here, he would, with some few remaining gene rights, create his Primarchs using his own genetic material as a template. Then subsequently, the very first of the new breed of warriors, the Space Marines, or Astartes. But what are the Thunder Warriors? Imperial records state that the Thunder Warriors were nearly all wiped out during a particularly bloody battle at the end of the Unification Wars on Mount Ararat. Conveniently, the new Legiones Astartes were created readily to replace them. Mm. Now, records from this time are understandably fragmented, but described eyewitness accounts from the few Thunder Warriors to survive this battle, like Arik Taranis, stated that it was in fact the Emperor himself who massacred the Thunder Warriors. Others have stated that it was also in collaboration with Eris. his custodian guard. In several instances that occurred since this time, where Thunder Warriors have appeared and faced their Astartes brothers, the Thunder Warriors have nearly always managed to inflict casualties beyond expectation before they are finally felled. This gives some indication of how powerful they were as warriors, and why the Emperor felt they were perhaps too dangerous, given their power and psychological instability, to function as a disciplined fighting and defensive force for the new Imperium. 
Regardless, this whole situation is a dark and little spoken of episode for the Emperor of Man. Vocalising these events would no doubt have some Inquisition or Ecclesiarchy on their way to you very promptly. With the Thunder Warriors killed in the Battle of Mount Ararat, the new Space Marines, the Legionis Astartes, would come to the fore. Unlike their Thunder Warrior forebears, they would undergo rigorous mental training as well as physical and genetic modifications. This would give them immense physical traits as well as being near unbreakable with their mental conditioning. The new marines were initially segregated into 20 legions. This separation was not for simple organisational purposes, each legion was imbued with genetic traits from their primarch and as such this impacted their character and behaviour. To ensure unity, the Emperor designated them to stay together. I do like how um, what uh, Luatin has been doing, or is doing here especially, is this is all information he has essentially already said, especially in the Imperium of Man videos, but he is reiterating it specifically because he's like, this is an, an Astarte specific video, so we are going to recover all this stuff that we already know. Granted, I think he's probably doing it um, a whole lot... Uh, He's explaining it in a shorter term than uh, in previous videos, but he is still like he is uh, re I'm blanking on what word I want to use here. He's uh, retracing his steps. He's 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 bringing every making sure everyone is up to speed on exactly what Space Marine is, and I do I do like that. That's really good. That's, that's really, really together good. in their legions to reduce friction and ensure cohesion of the Astartes brothers. Through recruiting and conquest of human colonies, as the Imperium expanded, so did the Astartes legions. What had begun as a handful of marines swelled to tens of thousands during the Crusades. This would lead later to heavy damage caused during the heresy after the Primarchs holding such immense power being the sole commanders of each Space Marine legion. After that period of chaotic incursion, Robut Gulliman, Primarch of the Ultramarines, would draft the Codex Astartes, and the remaining Loyalist Primarchs would, after much consideration, agree at best that the Space Marine Legions be split into chapters. This was to ensure no Space Marine Legion could wield the sheer weight of power they had during the Crusades and subsequent heresy. This was known as the Second Founding. Each of these chapters would take a permanent homeworld or fortress monastery in the Imperium. The Codex Astarte states that each chapter would be 1,000 Battle Brothers in number and manage its own recruitment. A specific development in the creation of a Space Marine was discovered after the Horus Heresy, weaknesses in the Gene Seed. Now, as I previously explained, the Gene Seed is the core biological component in the creation of a Space Marine. During the Heresy, Space Marines were created on a massive scale, and as with any biological replication process, if you do this on a large scale, then mutations and errors can occur in this okay. DNA replication. So another result of the implementation of the Codex Astartes by Gulliman was to slow the process of creating a Space Marine, to more closely monitor their genetic material and the material implanted within new recruits to ensure purity and expunge defects. Gulliman would also establish core genetic banks on Terra to ensure a stock of genetics existed. These pure sources would provide new material for the foundings of Astartes chap- Dude, Gulliman is the fucking G, dude and also prevent any further contamination. As previously described, each chapter is responsible for its own replenishment. It chooses where and how to locate potential Space Marine candidates. Many will recruit solely from their own homeworld, but others will reach out to hive worlds of the Imperium to locate powerful and resilient fighters who have shown promise and an unnatural ability in combat, even potentially recruiting from gang fighters in hive cities. Feral planets can also be good for selection as the humans here are physically tough and have to deal with daily hardships more frequently than some other Imperial planets. Surprisingly, less recruits actually appear from the militaristic worlds like fortress planets, maybe because although knowing lives of military discipline, they haven't endured the true horror and hardships that come from the rougher ends of Imperial life. Okay. Any candidate for a Space Marine will be usually young, between the ages of 10 and 15 years old. Obviously needed to be strong, healthy, oh. and fiercely loyal to the Imperium. Often on worlds where recruitment occurs, young male humans who show exceptional skill or strength 
are pushed hard to give them the best chance of potential recruitment. Candidates can occasionally be as old as 20, but the full effect of their biological conversions may not be as effective or complete. Standard trials for space marine recruitment often involve combat, endurance, perhaps hunting of some extremely dangerous indigenous animal, and for the few who survive the tasks set by the Astartes who are there to supervise, the rewards are beyond estimation. It's difficult to describe just how revered space marines are to ordinary citizens of the Imperium. While they wouldn't be directly worshipped, they are certainly individuals with godlike reverence and awe. Many humans in the Imperium will go their entire lives without ever even seeing an Astartes, and they may only arrive on an Imperial planet once in a generation. On some worlds, they are even somewhat mythical. So for a family on an Imperial world to have their son chosen for Space Marine recruitment and candidacy would be an honour beyond imagination. But from some perspectives, bittersweet in as all likelihood they may never see them again once die. they have been accepted, and in very high possibility will probably die in later processes. Yep. But it's nonetheless the highest honour to serve the Emperor and the Imperium in this way and would no doubt lead to adulation, even possible special treatment for families after the fact. Ordinary citizens understand that to be accepted for the conversion to the Astartes, the Emperor's chosen warriors, is nothing short of becoming a demigod. Then again, you could just as easily have been recruited from a hive world full of daily extreme violence, and your gang was just forcibly made to participate in the trials, mm. and you were simply the only one left alive at the end. So that's your flip side of the coin. Pray you never- But how- how would a gang be loyal? Like, why, 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 why take a gang though? Because they're probably not going. Like, how do you know they're going to be loyal to the Imperium as a whole? They're, they, 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 gangs form out of a distrust of government. That's why gangs exist. Because they feel the government isn't doing enough. Like, they, the government isn't fulfilling their needs. It's essentially how gangs form. Uh, you know, it's just like gangs are a gang is an aspect of, of being a gang is the intrinsic distrust of government. I don't I don't I don't see how that's a good recruitment tool. They seek acceptance to the Grey Knights. I'll cover that later. Despite all the physical and mental requirements I mean. for candidacy, another element is spiritual purity. In the 41st millennium, Imperial society is heavily Lord religious, worshipping the God Emperor, and most importantly decrying the ruinous powers of chaos. Chaplains and the ecclesiarchy will continually monitor society around Astartes' recruitment sources to ensure that there are no signs of taint by the dark forces of chaos. Aspirin. With the easy part over, the selected candidates, now <laughs> known as over. aspirants, will begin the ritual process of becoming a space marine. This may be a formal process of reciting scripture, or it could involve further trials. These could take place on the homeworld, or result in immediate departure for the aspirant. Each chapter has their own private and guarded initiations. Some of these can be heavily traumatic, and are usually significantly harder tests. Trauma in the 40k universe? No way. Designed to break those who show even the smallest cracks of weakness. These trials for the young aspirants may even include ritual slaughter, scarification, even amputation and bloodletting. It's yeah. all designed to prove their commitment, loyalty and unwavering faith in the Astartes chapter. Unsurprisingly, some aspirants do not pass this phase of testing physically or mentally. Aspirants will continue periods of testing and examination as well as actual live combat oh. during their period as a recruit for the Space Marine chapter. And some of these trials may be cleverly disguised as coming of age rituals, other celebrations some more combat based. All though will be observed carefully by senior members of the chapter and chaplains who will be assessing key traits and behaviours looking for candidates who fulfil their exacting requirements. Some of these aspirants from feral worlds or even other worlds may not be truly aware of what space marines are, and this innocence may in some way protect them from making overthought errors that cost them later. 
Still, some chapters actually take little interest in these early stages and will only actually become involved later once aspirants have been further thinned down. The whole process is a physical and psychological minefield. Some challenges could be unachievable, while others the simple act of survival is enough to merit approval to progress to the next stage. All the tests put to Space Marine aspirants are designed to test every element of their being to the limit and expose any weaknesses that are present, as well as learn about how they handle and make judgments on situations they are presented with. While the recruitment age for these aspirants is undoubtedly young, it's worth remembering that the nightmare environment of the 41st millennium is undoubtedly very harsh, and so growing up and becoming an adult quickly is something which many learn to do, and so their age shouldn't necessarily dictate your judgement of them based on our current period in time. Eh, they're still children. Standard Astartes trials for these young recruits can include knowledge of self, Astartes look at recruits' mental strength equally to the physical. The horrors they will face in their lives as a space marine despite later conditioning require the strongest character in a recruit to be successful and worthy. They may use a chapter librarian to impose psychic horrors on a recruit to see if they survive the nightmares they are forced to witness. He may be forced to take drugs and face the worst parts of his own psyche the stress and trauma of this trial can often physically affect their bodies as well, so in many ways this becomes the ultimate test for recruits. Completion of this trial will undoubtedly fundamentally alter the young recruit forever. Some chapters, like the Imperial Fists, consider this kind of mental testing especially important, but do so by exposing their recruits to literal physical pain, and we use devices mm. like the subtly Ugly. titled Pain Glove. These hook into the nervous system of the recruit and inflict horrific pain, but also maintain their consciousness well past what a normal individual could handle. Yeah. The result will either be a mentally toughened, but probably scarred individual, or a complete mental breakdown and death. An obvious and standard test for- Complete mental breakdown? That's me? I was gonna say, yeah, Tuesday nights at 9.03. No, it's every night. Every day. Every morning, every afternoon, mental breakdown, mental breakdown. For many recruits is exposure. Most worlds of the Imperium have unforgiving environments, and so sending out recruits into these wastes with little to survive with is an easy way to tell who is strong enough as a candidate. Space Marine apothecaries can rebuild damaged individuals, so the test is less of can you survive without consequences, and more simply, can you survive? Many oh. worlds are severely irradiated, Great. frozen wastes, toxic wastelands, or ashen wastes, where planets have suffered total ecological collapse. Alternately, a planet could also be a literal jungle full of horrific creatures, small and large, ready to tear you to pieces or just melt your face off. As stated, the test is simple, survive for a set period of time, it will also likely involve some object of crossing a distance from A to B so as to avoid recruits just digging a hole somewhere and sitting in it until time has elapsed. Some of the tests could well be impossible to complete and are simply assessing who can survive longest or travel furthest before dying or near death. The Ultramarines and Space Wolf chapters are known to favour exposure testing. A fairly self-explanatory trial, recruits are pitted against one another in one-on-one -on -one combat. When the last or last few remain, the assessing Astartes will usually halt the assessment. The type of duel could vary between armed or unarmed combat, consecutive combat, or recruits switching out on completing rounds. There is one constant though, and that is it's always a fight to the death. Again, apothecaries are mm. able to heal most ordinary human wounds with ease, so these fights are often fairly no-holds-barred brutal affairs. Amputation and heavy trauma being the norm. Unsurprisingly, duels are I the Blood this. Angels trial of choice, but others such as Dark Angels, Imperial Fists, and Space Wolves also put this trial to their recruits. War is life in the Imperium, and although some worlds know this more than others, planets used for recruitment usually have some form of regular combat going on. This trial is less a trial and more a means of assessing potential candidates. The studies may have observed headhunting particularly strong champions, or they may watch them from orbit, observing infighting between tribes on Imperial Feral Worlds. In this trial, recruits are tasked to head out into their homeworld and slay a beast for causing chaos or harm to their world. Many Imperial Worlds host highly dangerous lifeforms or worse, orc infestations. The recruit must go out alone, or sometimes in small groups, and return with their captured hunt often alive. 
With these group hunts though, the nasty twist is that there can only be one successful recruit. So they could turn on each other, break off alone to achieve or steal victory. I personally question the validity of this test. Fighting to the death to show strength over others seems plausible, but setting out in as a group, but then betraying other recruits seems to go kind of against the traits Astartes look for yep. in recruits. I was thinking the anyway, same thing. On returning home, they'll be required to slay their successful hunt in a ritual in front of their community before being led successfully away in the throes of glory. Lastly, the quite vague challenge trial. And this is exactly what it is, some form of probably unsurmountable challenge. This could be to attempt to fight a full-blown space marine in combat. Huh? An impossible task, you might imagine, but usually remember this is the 41st millennium and bizarre occurrences are abound. While the thought of a child fighting a space marine seems insane, remember the task is usually to see how they approach it, not necessarily their success. In some extremely rare situations though, the aspirant may actually beat the space marine challenger. As completely impossible as this may seem, that individual usually will hold some unusual or rare power and will go on to become a legendary hero of the chapter. The aspirant will also usually be armed while the space marine unarmed and without his power armor. Still, okay. as with most of the former trials, the test here is really about if they can just survive at all, not so much best their opponent. Other arguably more horrific tests though could be non-combat based and test a recruit's strength, speed, mental skill or resistance to toxins. So they might for example be forced to drink nightmarish toxic chemicals, lift weights so heavy they break their bones apart, or evade some kind of horrific dangerous trap. With recruits what? deemed to have succeeded by whatever standards, however unlikely, will then be restored by chapter apothecaries. Ultramarines and again Imperial Fists favour these trials. Clearly a great many recruits will not survive this stage of assessment, but even those who fail to be accepted but by some miracle survive will usually be heavily respected for having done so, not just by their families and friends, but by the assessing Astartes. Having done no wrong but maybe just not made the cut, these surviving but unsuccessful aspirants who were assessed on their home world may return to their former communities, a rare occurrence. Mm. Or they may continue on to serve the chapter as a serf, a menial but loyal servant who takes personal care of say a marine's armour and weaponry. Those returned to their homes are extremely few, but surprisingly are not perceived as failures. It would be made clear to all that having just survived, they have shown sheer strength and integrity as an Imperial citizen. They would then likely go on to become a strong leader for that world as Imperial Guard, Planetary Defense Force, or some other leadership. Yeah, that one makes sense. I get that. Neophyte. Successful aspirants will now become neophytes. They will move on to the next stage where they'll begin the early stages of conversion to a full space marine with the initial implantation of the gene seed and chemical adaptation of their genetically enhanced organs. This could mean immediate departure with a space marine brother to the next phase or it may be that they are allowed to celebrate in their home community before departure. A very huge moral boost for the Imperial community there and also to help reinforce Imperial values and loyalty. To be able to say your community gained a successful Astartes recruit is no small thing and statues, paintings, songs and stories will be told for many years if not generations to come. Neophytes will be expected to engage in training for combat as well as other mental training as well as following chapter lore. If a neophyte should break chapter lore through ignorance or unthinkably by deliberately doing so, they will uh. expect severe punishments. A neophyte breaking chapter lore will not simply be thrown out, they would likely be mind scrubbed, live out their lives as either best case scenario chapter serfs, being menial servants or worse, forcible amputation and body conversion to life as cybernetic drones and slaves as servitors. Uh, no. Successful oh, no, no, neophytes no. immediately will begin conditioning to be implanted with their gene seeds and relevant genetic enhancements. Space uh. marines must be male because the gene seed is only compatible with male hormones and genetics. So no, you won't see female space marines. 
The neophytes also need to be tested for compatibility. Or what if? I'm always kind of surprised that this doesn't happen before the recruitment trials, but anyway, so they're tested for compatibility otherwise as with organ transplants. Rejection would be fatal for the neophyte, even with this testing it can still happen later down the line. They will then further have their mental strength checked before implantation of the gene seed begins to ensure that they are in no way compromised by the forces of chaos. Initiate. If all these criteria are approved, the neophyte recruit will now become a Space Marine Scout, or in some cases a full Space Marine Initiate. They will live isolated in the Space Marine Chapter's Fortress Monastery on the homeworld, save for any approved missions. The individual will be tutored on battle methods, tactics, psycho-conditioning, values and the history of his chapter. The reason these early marines are titled initiates is because it is still unknown as to whether they will even survive to the final end process of becoming a full battle brother. Alright, so I want to hear the number statistics here on how many people go in and how many is affected. Right, we know it's what, um, 3 in 10? Survive the trial of grasses for the Witcher universe. Um, how many survive this one in every hundred thousand? Nineteen organs grown from the chapter gene seed will be implanted to the neophyte initiate. Some are transplants and others are grown in the trainee marine's body. The gene seed will also adapt and change and grow the individual's body to become the giant size of a space marine towering over ordinary mortal humans. Much of the body chemistry will be fundamentally reworked during this time, and the gene seed contains genetically engineered viral machines which rebuild the body to the template created by the Emperor. Any implant has a potential to fail, and this rejection will automatically end and probably kill the <laughs> initiate. As if the odds Christ. weren't stacked against them already, it. it's, it's this further thins down the number who survive to the end of this arduous process. In brief, the 19 implanted or grown organs to become a full space marine are as Phases. 19 phases. Oh boy. Follows. First, a secondary heart to increase blood supply and capacity. It can also pump steroids and extra adrenaline for battle situations. The osmodular or iron heart. This strengthens and grows the skeleton of a space marine so that his bones will contain a ceramic based mineral which is added to an initiate's diet. After a few years, the space marine skeleton will be exponentially stronger than a normal human. The rib cage will have become fused to a solid bone plate, providing extra protection for internal organs. The biscopia is implanted within the chest cavity. Well, hold on. Are we certain that a solid bone plate is actually more, better to protect the organ, right? Because of the human body. Well... I guess that would be the difference between plate mail and chain mail. I guess if we want to look at the way our ribs are currently, we could look at our ribs currently as kind of chain mail. Um, and then what they're doing here as plate mail. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. And this increases skeletal muscular development, essentially muscle density. The hemastomen assists in carrying oxygen and nutrients more efficiently throughout the blood. It also assists in regulating the second and third implants. The larimens organ is also placed in the chest and manufactures synthetic larimen cells. These serve like ordinary human blood platelets but faster and more efficient. When a space marine is wounded they form fully healed scar tissue in seconds preventing Hemorrhaging. This ability can make space marines appear invincible as they take wound now, hold after. Hold on, the numbers here are a little weird because it says the Kalipskin node goes in 14 to 17 years, but then these ones after are 14 to 16. But this phase six has to come in first before phase is seven. A wound. Uh, Anything other than the most catastrophic weird. of injuries mm. is going to leave them still standing. The catalepsian node is implanted in the back of the cerebrum. It allows space marines to avoid the need for sleep, entering them into a form of ongoing coma, allowing their brain the ability to systematically recharge by individual parts at a time. This enables them to stay on duty for hundreds of hours. 
The seventh Ooh. implant is the preomnor. It functions as a decontamination chamber above the stomach and will analyze ingested materials, neutralizing any organic or inorganic toxins. It also enables the studies to eat materials for sustenance that would kill ordinary humans. Yummy. The omophagia is implanted in the upper spinal cord. It absorbs information through ingested DNA and RNA related to memories. The purpose is to gain tactical or survival information by eating animals or life forms indigenous on a planet. In addition to a second heart, space marines also have multi-lungs as their ninth implant. Three, in fact. This is to give them extra oxygen absorption in thin air environments. In a toxic environment, their ordinary lungs are shut off to allow the third lung to act as a filter for any necessary toxins. The no tenth part. adaptation is the ocular lobe. It's a gene seed adaptation that enhances eyesight along the optic nerves. This gives increased accuracy of vision and increased low light sight ability. Lyman's ear is not simply better for more accurate hearing, it enables Marines to resist ordinary human dizziness and for them to be able to filter out white noise and sonic attacks. The Sasan membrane allows a Space Marine to enter a state of suspended animation. This can enable mortally wounded Marines to survive until help or an apothecary's arrival. This hibernation period has been known to be able to last for anything as long as half a century. Melanochrome oh. alters the pigments in the skin cells, allowing Astartes to shield himself from dangerous radiation and heat. Different levels of this, in effect, can cause physical differences between chapters, such as the very pale skin of the Blood Angels or the darker skin of the Salamanders. The ulitic kidney filters blood to further remove toxins that have been ingested in combination with the seventh organ. It is best not to think of this though like an ordinary kidney, as this organ functions to assist in removing toxins before they have passed through any normal process of absorption, otherwise it wouldn't be very useful. It also helps to regulate the advanced circulatory system and other organs. The neuroglottis in the mouth allows a marine to biochemically analyse things by taste or smell, or determine if something is poisonous or safe. Despite their advanced organs, this could still be very useful for a variety of purposes, and it can also enable them to track targets, much like a canine. The mucronoid is implanted in the nervous system, and if activated through an external treatment, will cause the Astadi skin to secrete a waxy substance. This will cocoon them to protect them in situations of extended suspended animation, even the vacuum of space or other temperature extremes. Mm. The Betcher's gland consists of two glands implanted in the mouth. These allow the studies to use their saliva as a corrosive acid when consciously activated. This could enable them to corrode bars if they were held captive or remove doors from their hinges. It also can assist them in eating difficult to break down substances. If taken captive, here's the thing. I don't think anyone gets taken prisoner in this universe. Some marine chapters have nice. found that this organ no longer functions or has become less effective over time. The progenoid glands or the gene seeds are the critical organs of a space marine. They're implanted into the neck and chest cavity and serve as reproductive glands to allow their DNA to be collected upon death and safeguard the continuity of the chapter. Apothecaries of a space marine chapter will cultivate germ cells from the progenoid glands to create the 19 organs of a space marine, or some of them because some are grown within the space marine themselves. The final organ is the black carapace, otherwise called the interface. This material is implanted under the skin of the chest with the now shell-like ribcage. Fibred mm. bundles then grow inward and interlink with the space marine's nervous system. Points for these bundles are pre-cut by apothecaries and form neural connection points. The function of these are to uh -huh. allow a space marine to interface with the heavy power armor, or as some would have you believe, the armor's machine spirit. These connections enable faster reaction and maneuverability. Without this, space marines would lumber around very much encumbered by the heavy armor they wear. It's worth remembering that this whole process probably sounds heavily traumatic, but consider that it yeah. ideally happens on the young neophyte or initiates between the ages of about 10 to 12 years old and should be then completed by age 18. Many are going to suffer critical or multiple organ failure during the process. The Don't penalty reassuring. or arguably mercy for this is usually euthanasia, although conversion to a servitor for the chapter is sometimes an option depending on chapters and their needs. Again, for those families who never see their sons again, in some cases, it's probably for the best. All they need to know is, he's serving the Imperium. 
Now, more recently, since the involvement of yeah. Belisarius, Call of the Mechanicum, Primaris Marines are a new breed of superhuman Astartes. Under instruction from Robert Gulliman, Primaris Astartes are only created from the gene seeds of Loyalist Primarchs. They contain three additional organs, and their gene seed is considerably more genetically stable. Gulliman had instructed Call to develop these new organs with the goal of creating the Primaris, and their additional organs are the sinew coils. This enables the sinew of a Primaris Astartes to be durametallic, contracting with immense force, gifting them extreme strength and his body further resilience. This increased strength will literally enable them to crush the skulls of their enemies with bare hands. The Magnifact, and this small lobe is inserted to the brain cortex. It secretes a hormone to increase the body's growth functions, with the goal of also intensifying further functions of the other implanted organs. Apparently, this organ is in fact half of the Immortus gland, the god-maker gland of the Primarchs. For undisclosed reasons, Kaul was only able to discover the right half of this gland, not the full gland itself. The left half had been fully eradicated from Imperial records by either the Emperor himself or others unknown and third, the Belisarian Furnace. This organ so lies dormant and connects to both a marine's hearts. In times of immense physical stresses, it expels chemicals simulating... Hold on, are they fighting orcs? Are those, are those orc machines right there? Are those... fighting a, a wag? can't quite tell. You can't see who exactly they're shooting, but I'm going to say they're fighting a wag. Those look like orc machines combat stimulants, increasing the regrowth of tissue, bone and muscle. This is a short term use organ and requires time to recharge after using. Studies. Oh boy, here we are. Now, if this incredibly harrowing physical conversion is successful, the neophyte or initiate will have completed the arguably most challenging part of his transformation. However, during these changes, they will still be undergoing some of the most challenging training and assessment regimes humanity had ever known psychological and physical conditioning, subconscious therapy, and endless live battle training sessions. Their senses and mental abilities far exceed ordinary humans by the end of this process. Their mental toughness is beyond measure, and an Astartes will essentially ignore pain and environmental conditions. As one does. An Astartes will yeah. assault enemies who, to simply look upon, would make an ordinary human suffer a complete mental break. Many, through endless conditioning, will develop photographic memories. Much of this round-the-clock therapy will also neutralize any latent character flaws and create stable, highly single-minded warriors. This endless mental and physical indoctrination will also teach and reinforce high respect for authority and to expertly carry out orders. With that said, it's important to remember that Space Marines are not mindless drones or clones. They are individuals, and while always following the rule of command, if a situation warrants it, they are entirely capable of disobeying orders if they believe it to be ultimately necessary. The consequences for this though could be, and usually are, potentially highly severe. At the end of this process, the few successful young children who were pitted against one another and survived the ordeals to reach this point will be welcomed as successful young initiates becoming full Space Marine Battle Brothers, Imperial Astartes, the greatest warriors in the galaxy. Astartes aging War. though does seem somewhat random, with some living even as long as 10,000 years. But given Jesus. the fractured and strange nature of time in the 41st millennium, it can be really hard to put accurate expectancies on this, and many marines who are not killed may reach at least half a century in age. It's no exaggeration to state that on successfully becoming an Astartes, these men would be far from what you would recognize as human. Their extended lives and nearly unbreakable bodies are truly no prize. Their lives from this point on are spent in the sole act of defending humanity and the Imperium of Man. Accepting that their lives will be lost in battle at some point in the future, probably in horrific circumstances, they'll never see any yeah, this man's losing an arm. anyone they had ever known in their lives again. Families, friends will die far before they even begin to think of such things. Space Marines are the protectors. Humanity in the 41st millennium stands on a precipice. We have known many horrors, disasters, and catastrophes, the ending of many worlds, but the next millennia will be the most critical. Threats surround humanity 
some are still difficult to gauge just how severe and if we can resist them. Our hope is in the Astartes and the Imperium of Man and the Emperor. With the Primarch Robot Gilliman returned, there is a glimmer of hope in the darkness. Man never changes, so war never changes. Okay, that's a bit cynical. Helium, I thought you were supposed to be the hopeful commander. Is not all right. Um, that was Space Marine Creation slash Recruitment, your guide on becoming an Astartes Warhammer 40k lore by Lewitin. Uh, this was a good video. Um, I don't really. There wasn't really much for me to say because he was just kind of. There's a lot of information coming at me, so I feel like really anything for me to say. I was just like kind of just trying to keep track of it all as it was getting flung into my ears. Um, and I don't know how much of this information is still in here. <laughs> um, but yeah, this was a good video. Uh, I, I like Lewitin's style, um, for the most part. Um, uh, I got nothing else to say here at the end. I, I hope you guys enjoyed. Remember to hit that like button and subscribe for more. And I will see you guys in the video. Peace.